ABC. Middale, I'm Liam Friedman, Dr. Drew. Of course, America's the land of the free because of the brave. On this Veterans Day, we thank and honor those who served. One of those is veteran fighter and co-author of Survivor's Obligation, Joel Neeb, Joel Thor Neeb. You can follow him at Joel Thor Neeb and EEB on Twitter, Afterburner.com and WarriorsHeart.com. Joel, welcome to the program. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Excited to be here. Tell us about Survivor's Obligation. So Survivor's Obligation, Dr. Drew, came from an experience back in 2010. In that time frame, I was a fighter pilot. I was on top of the world. Everything was going great, beautiful family. And then the worst happened. I found out I had stage four cancer. Mm. I was given about a 15% chance to live. And, you know, almost unbelievably at the exact same time, we discovered a tumor in my then three-year-old son in his lung. Duh. Oh, boy. Oh, my God. And I'm, I'm sure you would have gladly taken another cancer as opposed to having him get sick like that. Yeah, you're exactly right. And I, you, as a caretaker, I think that's the hardest thing. As both the caretaker and the patient at the same time, the one who was really uh, challenged Your was wife. my poor wife. Yeah. Yeah. Taking, yeah, exactly, taking care of both of us. So what kind of cancer do you have? Do you mind me asking? Absolutely not. So it's mucinous adenocarcinoma of the appendix. If you think of uh, like Stuart Scott, the ESPN commentator, mm -hmm. he, he passed away from it several years ago. Uh, Aubrey Hepburn passed away from it. It's super deadly. Super uh, really rare. rare. Super rare. Usually yeah. you get a carcinoid in the appendix, but the mucinous adeno is more actually associated with like ovarian cancers. Oh, wow. But uh, all bad. And then your son, did he end up having a cancer? Was that benign? His was benign, but it grew to about a quarter size in his little three-year-old lung, and so he had to have most of his left lung removed in the process, Jeez. but thank God it was benign. Yeah. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So you did the full treatment and you survived uh, amazingly, and that's where your obligation has come from? It is. So So what ended up happening was, of course, you know, I'm at death's door figuratively, and, and my doctor told me that keep, keep expecting the bad news to come. And I was sitting in these chemo rooms with these unbelievable people who were so optimistic, and they kept, you know, sharing what they were going to do when they got better, and they were so supportive. It's, I was really getting a glimpse of people in their finest moments. And then, sadly, the week you come back, they, they wouldn't be there. Someone right. wouldn't uh, be responding to treatment. Right. And this happened again and again. Right. And on, on the other side of it, I, I knew I had to do something. Once I started seeing that I was going to live through this, I, I didn't carry survivor's remorse like a lot of people do, a sense of guilt over making it through something. I, I did carry an obligation, though, to live out what we committed to in that room and, uh, and to really make the second chance count for those that, that didn't have that opportunity. Did you, as a veteran and a warrior, did that... Uh... You know, did that experience shape how you viewed this challenge? You know, great question. I don't think anything can prepare you for it. Yeah. So when, when I when I first got the diagnosis and my son's going through it, I you know I was inconsolable. I was basically curled up in the fetal position, feeling really sorry for myself for 30 days. I do like to believe that the principles that that we live with as fighter pilots and warriors, they definitely played into my ability to bounce back, but. But certainly not in that first 30 days. There's just nothing that, that can make you ready for that experience. And can we talk a little bit? Again, it is Veterans Day about your fighter pilot experience. Mm -hmm. You you were in the air uh, in the aftermath of 9-11. Is that correct? So we were. We flew missions for Operation Noble Eagle, uh, which meant we uh, guarded the borders after the attacks of 9-11 for many years. And then we also escorted the president through the skies when he'd fly abroad or, or even go in, into domestic locations. You know, it's funny. One of my memories of um, the immediate aftermath of 9-11 was, first of all, lying in bed and at night and just, you know, not knowing where we were going. You know, mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of unanswered questions That's about right. what was happening. But how silent the skies were. Yes. You don't realize how much stuff is in the air in a major city until there's nothing in the air except at night. I could hear the low drone of the B-2 going over. Oh, wow. Just this deep throttle going through the air and i thought oh my god where am i living yeah were you part of that whole operation joel down here in southern california so not in southern california at that point i was on the east coast but definitely know what you're talking about and it, it almost felt apocalyptic right it was like yeah. a, one of those zombie movies the whole world just stopped turning for us for a little while and uh yeah definitely living a nightmare am i right that i was hearing the b2 overhead i mean just to, i just assumed that's what it was and 
is, is that how you protected this part of the country probably because edwards air force base is right there and that's a mm -hmm. plane that could take a big region right yeah that can take a big region but most likely it was going to be an f-15c or an f-16 because they're they're predominantly looking for other aircraft and the b-2 does bombing and so that those other fighter planes would be making sure that another attack didn't occur uh via an, an airplane got it wow that's so i mean i remember having to fly um i had a flight actually the the maybe the day after 9-11 I believe and of course it, everything was canceled for those few days and then my brother and I both flew to Houston to see my grandmother that came in from Hong Kong to visit our, our aunt and um it was me and one other guy on a plane from LA to Houston yeah. and and I was like oh my god is this weird are we gonna are we gonna yeah. be shut out of the sky are we gonna you know and and the flight attendants all looked at me and the one guy did the whole you know pre-flight thing and they were like you know this is probably the safest day to fly of any because there was so much security at the airport even though nobody was there it was a ghost town but they opened up the airports and there was just this me one guy on a huge Jeez. plane it was it was pretty wild it was kind of eerie we are I gotta take a little break um Joel, so hang on a second. We're going to speak to your co-author, Chris Strickland, Chris Strickland, in the next hour. Uh, two veteran pilots with different experiences. And when we come back from this break, I want to talk about PTSD, post-traumatic stress, and post-traumatic growth and your philosophy on that front, okay? Love it. Can't you wait. Got it. Joel Neeb, Leanne Tweeden, Dr. Drew. It's Midday Live, AM790, KBC. That's Leanne Tweeden. I'm Dr. Drew. It's Midday Live, AM790, KBC. And we're going back out to Joel Neeb, Joel Thor Neeb. You can find him at Twitter. It's Joel Thor Neeb, N E E B. And we were talking about a philosophy that he and his co author have uh, coined, which is post traumatic growth, uh, which I'm imagining is kind of a leaning in process mm -hmm. to the notion of uh, post traumatic stress, Joel. Yeah, it absolutely is. It's, it's the part that we get to choose, that we get to embrace. You know, we, we wholeheartedly acknowledge that post traumatic stress and the scars, both emotional and physical, will always be there with us in, from, the, from the trials in our lives. I certainly bear the physical and emotional scars from having cancer and being told I was going to die in 18 months. But the phenomenon that Chris and I both experienced, and then we quickly learned that we weren't alone in, was this, this enhancement of our lives on the other side of this trial. I was actually just talking to somebody within the last hour that lost his son in a drowning accident and Oof. talked about some of the, the similar characteristics. And he, it's, it goes back to a phrase that, that resonates with me that the dying often have the most to teach us about life. Mm. And I think what that comes down to is there's a clarity in the valleys of our life and they're horrible and we have to endure them. And we certainly don't wish for them for the lessons that we get from, from those moments. But if we have the presence of mind to be able to sift through the chaos and the noise of everything that's occurring in those valleys, there is a lesson and there's something for us to change on the other side. And it's, and it's amazing how many people talk about, their, the transformative moments in their lives started with this horrible thing that occurred, and it, and it gave them the clarity to change in the future. So, so post-traumatic growth is just that. Yeah, so, so I have a lot of these statements and questions on the other side of that. Uh, one is, it's funny, I was thinking about that this morning. Somebody um, asked me about something about what I was doing, and she was, how are you able to do that? And I go, I don't, I don't know, I just am able to. And then I thought, oh, my training kicked the crap out of me. Mm -hmm. And that adversity and really, and I started worrying about the way we're training our physicians today. Where we're not kicking the crap out of right. them. We're letting them go home and all this stuff. Yeah. Yep. And, and I thought, wow, that, that kind of struggle is really where resiliency and grit and all this stuff comes from. And we have uh, obfuscated that in a lot of areas. And again, back to the millennial stuff mm -hmm. you and I were talking mm -hmm. about earlier. That's right. And it's these horrible things, these, uh, these extreme challenges that you know give that, us that really it, forge people's personalities yeah. and their traits for the rest of their yeah. lives so, so uh, that's just a statement supporting your 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 uh, what do you call it post-traumatic growth but my question though is any specific things people should be doing to sort of you know get over lean into the horrible the the, the residual in the body and lean into the soul a little bit to get some growth yeah, great question. So practically speaking, here's here's what I've learned. I had another cancer scare last spring since it's stage four, and we're nine years into this journey. Jeez. At any time, it could come back. And and so um, I'm still in our mission, doing fantastic. I was on Ninja Warrior last year and, you know, and feeling fantastic. But last spring, I got some symptoms come back, and the doctor said it's probably cancer. And I was sitting in this waiting room, and I said, all right, let's put this to use. You know, you wrote a book about it. Let's actually see. Let's put this to use and learn something from this moment. And what I did was I just took stock of my life up until that point. And I said, if this is the worst and I have six months to live, what would I do differently? And, and what are the things that I would remove from my life? What are the, the non-essentials that I'm allowing to clutter up my life? Because we only get one shot at it no, more, no matter what. 
what are we doing to live intentionally? And I came up with three things I was going to do differently on the other side of even this uh, cancer scare, no matter whether or not I was healthy or not. And I wrote myself a letter. I committed to that. And that was the clarity I got from that, that situation. Fortunately, cancer hadn't come back, but those principles and that moment of clarity still remain. And I think everybody gets that. That's why we, we're so interested in people who are facing their end of life. And you say, what would you do differently? Because we know there's going to be wisdom that we can apply to ourselves in that moment that we lack at any other point in our life. Yeah, it's it's easy to say, but man, when your face is pressed yeah. to the mirror like that, it's it's a it's a daunting and difficult thing. Do you think that your training, you know, your your military training and just your discipline of being a fighter pilot and things like that helped you get through your personal experiences with cancer and just sort of having to face, you know, the reality that your life could be ending soon and 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 like just how you're mentally able to sort of push forward through it? Yeah, I definitely think I was forced to face mortality a lot younger. Um, in direct ways by losing friends to airplane accidents and to, and to war. And then, and then through indirect ways, as I'm 22 years old and, and given the, uh, the opportunity to fly solo in the airplane after only seven flights, which is the process in flight training, going hundreds of miles an hour and thinking, I'm not ready for this, but everyone else says I am. Here I go. And, that's what my husband said in training, too, when they left him. And my husband's well, that, a pilot, too. He's way, a cargo pilot. Hey, by the way, that's the way it is being a physician, too. It's like... One day you're an intern, next day you're a resident. Yeah. You take all the decisions. Go, go. I know. Have at it. Yesterday uh, I was an intern. What's uh, different today? Yeah. <laughs> I remember Chris said when he was at the Air Force Academy, and he's like, "Yeah, just one day you're you're soloing, and you're just like, oh my god, yeah. you know." With this, but it's true yeah. in every rough profession. You you never are feel that you're fully ready, and that's why you, the people that train you throw you in. Yep. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, very interesting, and we appreciate your spending a little time with yeah. us. Of course. <laughs> Happy Veterans Day. I know it's a it's a weird thing to say, like Happy Veterans Day, but we we really do appreciate and thank you for your service and your families. It was my privilege. You know, I always say that I I really didn't sacrifice to be a fighter pilot. It was a dream come true. I couldn't believe it paid me to do it. The last pitch I'll give for all veterans is that I was one of the lucky ones. There are massive sacrifices occurring, whether that's broken families or lives lost in the battlefield or returning with PTSD. And there's there's many different types of casualties of war. But I would, I would tell them, tell everyone listening that beyond thanking veterans for their service, look at for opportunities to put these amazing American heroes onto your business team and apply the same skills that won in the most complex, dynamic, high-stakes environments in the world and succeeded on the battlefield to work for your can't-fail business initiatives. You won't regret it, and it's going to be an amazing second chapter for that veteran. I yes, love sir. that. I love yes, that, sir. Joel. Thank you very much. Joel Neeb at thank Joel, Joel. Thor Neeb, Afterburner.com, WarriorsHeart.com. Warriors Heart's a nonprofit. Honors our warriors, the veterans, active military, and first responders who've dedicated their lives to defend us. Again, the book is called Survivor's Obligation. Get it. 800 222 is our phone number. That's the end of Dr. Drew. It's Midday Live, AM 790 KBC.